let me introduce you then to uh, the Tizal Chile people who are here with us, which would be my dear friend, Carla Palma, who is waving her hand. Hey. Carla is vice president of Tizal Chile. And for now, uh, I will introduce myself, Barbara Etchard. I am Tizal Chile president for this period. And we are very, very happy and thankful for having all of you here. And we hope you all are safe and well. So let's take it away. So I would like to introduce you to our two special guests who will be conducting the webinar today. So we have Dr. Marlon Valencia. He is assistant professor, ESL program director, and Open Learning Center Director in the Department of English at Glendon College, York University. He teaches content ESL and applied linguistics. His research interests include multiliteracies, language politics, wait, I lost it, there you go, <laughs> language politics, the use of technology in the language classroom like the webinar we're going to have today, as well as the intersection between creativity, imagination, teachers and language learners' identities as well. Dr. Valencia is a licenciado in Lenguas uh, Modernas from Universidad del Valle in Colombia. He holds an MA in Foreign Languages and Cultures from Washington State University. He holds an MA in Applied Linguistics from York University. And he completed his PhD in Language and Literacy Education as well as a collaborative PhD program in comparative international and development education at the University of Toronto. And I was lucky enough to meet him. And we also have Elise Snydero. Am I right? Am I pronouncing it correctly? It's pronouncing the Spanish way. The French oh. way, Snydero. Oh, oh, oh no. I'm... <laughs> Don't worry, Great. I have all of them. <laughs> you have all of them. I'm a multi-identity, <laughs> fantastic cultural identities. So Elise, <laughs> is a professional communicator and a freelancer graphic designer. After three years working actively as the head of communication for a nonprofit organization in France, she challenged herself to improve her skills in English and studied public relations in Ontario, Canada. Today, she's a graduate of public relations corporate communication from Sheridan College, Oakville. Being an avid traveler, Ellie speaks three languages and aims to help global organizations transform and impact society through creative and meaningful media content. She believes that in the digital age that we're living right now, <laughs> uh, inspiring visuals and graphic design can help communicate more effectively, influence behavior, and assist everyone. But particularly, assist language learners negotiate their evolving social identities. So thank you, Marlon and Elise for being here. And I would like to give you now uh, the turn so that you can start this wonderful webinar. Thank you guys. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, um, Barbara, um, Carla, um, and Tisol Chile uh, for this invitation. I feel truly honored to be here with such VIPs. Uh, and thank you, Elise. Uh, Elise was my, uh, she's my former student, and uh, she will be giving us uh, some of the um, student insights, uh, so student perspective, which is so important. Um, so I'm going to start, um, and uh, as you see um, in our title, uh, we have uh, leveraging technology in the ESL or EFL classroom. And we're going to try to make a case for the merging of digital and traditional literacies and by technology, we mean whatever you have at your disposal, whether it's a, a fancy gadget or even if it's uh, just a, a piece of paper and a pen, right? So I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview about our presentation. So uh, it has four parts. So the first part is like to help us ground ourselves in our teaching contexts, and we're going to be sharing some of the uh, struggles that uh, I myself as, a, as an instructor and my students uh, have had. Uh, number two will give you a little bit of a background on the uh, research informed practices that uh, we will be discussing. Uh, number three is more of a show and share in which we uh, discuss and uh, share some of the um, activities that we've done in uh, 
and I'm mindful of the current situation uh, because we have this uh, duality uh, at the moment. Uh, we are teaching remotely, but we're expected to also think about the future when we go back to a bricks and mortar classroom. So we'll be looking at both possibilities. Uh, and number part number four is uh, for you to um, share your wonderful ideas and uh, questions, because I know that uh, we've all learned a lot in this past year, and there's a lot to share. And uh, I would love to hear from you as well. And uh, Elise will be um, giving us those uh, insider perspectives, which we uh, all truly value as teachers. All right. so. Uh, Let's get started. So just being mindful of questions and uh, on this exercise of grounding ourselves in our teaching contexts, I have this big umbrella question like, and the question reads, uh, how do we teach literacies in our classrooms? And if we look more in detail at what this question could mean, then uh, there's these uh, other uh, questions and I'm gonna move myself to the left here. Um, so what is literacy? Like what is literacy in Espanol? What is that? What are learners' uh, um, everyday literacy practices? What do these uh, practices look like? What types of literacy are we expected to teach in our classrooms? And how are the forms of uh, literacy that our students engage in in their everyday lives different to the ones that we're expected to teach in the classrooms? So feel free to post your answers uh, to those questions or to the big umbrella question uh, in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll take them um, later. Good. Oh. Great, I see some of my friends from Chile are joining. Uh, excellent. So the two contexts that uh, were, um, I've been teaching recently. The first context is where I met Elise. Uh, so it was an English for academic purposes class, uh, reading and writing pre-undergraduate final course. So I was uh, pretty much a gatekeeper. If my students passed my course with a good grade, like um, a particular percentage, then they would go to their um, academic programs because they had met the ESL requirement, right? And this was at a Canadian Polytechnic, and that is an institution that is uh, focused on undergraduate studies. And context number two is a university uh, where I teach content EAP, uh, to Franco dominant, uh, that is French speaking undergraduate students, and the courses are uh, two uh, second year courses. So, what were my struggles? So, uh, there were pretty much three things. Uh, one of them was like that, well, teaching academic reading and writing didn't seem that appealing to my students. So uh, lots of complaints like, oh, this is too boring. Like, why do we have to learn again how to write an essay, this and that. Uh, recurrent mistakes without any significant improvement. So I could spend the whole weekend marking essays, give them back, and then I would see the same mistake all over again in the new essay. And uh, plagiarism. So lots of um, fragments taken from other um, texts that were not properly cited uh, as required using APA style. Uh, no references. And I said like, what can I do about this? So I went to literature and in the literature, I found that uh, there were pretty much uh, like three different approaches to teaching academic reading and writing in um, EAP. One is a, a genre-based uh, approach, which you might be familiar with. So like, oh, we're going to learn how to write an essay. We're going to learn how to write an email. We're going to learn how to write a lab report. So very focused on what type of writing and the purpose of that writing, right? Um, another approach is the rhetorical approach focused on how texts are organized. So my students had to learn how to write a, a, contra, uh, um, a compare and contrast essay, uh, 
descriptive essay, uh, narrative essay, uh, an argumentative essay. And then the third one is um, looking more at the diverse repertoire of literacies and possibilities that um, English language learners engage in and that they have. However, as we know from literature, and uh, Tribble explains this uh, quite well, textbooks are mostly based on uh, the two first approaches and not the last one. So not a lot of recognition for digital literacies, right? Which we now know that are super important because this is what we're doing now, right? This is our everyday lives uh, these days. So that, um, if you look at uh, textbooks, then you see a lot of this. Uh, so that is traditional print-based uh, reading and writing, print-based text, reading and writing, essay, essay, essay. That's what those textbooks are um, mostly about. Then connecting to the internet maybe uh, to find some resources or doing some research, but it's all about the traditional print-based text. So what I found in the literature, to uh, look at this from a critical perspective, uh, what I found particularly inspiring was the work of uh, Alistair Pennycook. And he says that avoiding plagiarism needs to be seen not as some academic converse, uh, convention students need to master, but rather as a complex constellation of issues to do with concepts of the author and textual ownership, questions of language, learning, and saying things in one's words. Uh, cultural and educational orientations toward text and memorization and therefore questions of language and identity. And if we go back to the title of the presentation, we have EFL and ESL classrooms, right? And if we think about that, that's English as a foreign language. It's a foreign language. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to someone else. And if we think about the label of English as a second language, uh, second will never be the first. So that's something that we need to look at more critically. And uh, it's, it's a bit complex and I'll explain why um, in my next slides. So this is part two of the presentation. How did I uh, reconcile my experiences with what I've learned as a scholar and as a researcher uh, and I decided to have four pillars in my um, orientation to this course. So first of all, I wanted to engage writing as uh, and acknowledge it as the uh, creative process that it is. So focusing much more on creativity uh, that would allow learners to embrace the power of imagination to create. And of course, uh, going back to uh, Penny Cook's ideas, uh, criticality is super important because um, one of the issues that I found that was particularly challenging to many of my students was like finding that voice that would question what a published author had said. Because many of my students just thought like, I cannot question authority. It's inappropriate, right? Um, and then that would allow them to negotiate legitimate language user identities. Because if you feel that uh, you can be a legitimate user of the language, then that has a huge impact on uh, your learning. So two notions that I want to discuss, I won't get too much into the theoretical, the theoretical uh, side here. Uh, one of them is identity. I view it uh, from uh, Bonnie Norton's perspective. So identity is how a person understands his or her relationship to the world, how that relationship is structured across time and space, and how the person understands possibilities for the future. So identity, as I told uh, Elise in our class, is who I was because the decisions I made in the past made me be here today, who I am today because I'm here today uh, also thinking about what I want to be in the future. And I'm making decisions today based on what I imagine about my future. So there's a lot of imagination and possibilities in this definition of identity. 
The other uh, theoretical concept that I want to uh, show you today is uh, Jim Cummins' nested pedagogical orientations. So uh, Cummins says that uh, the transmission, which is what we associate with uh, a more teacher-centered form of pedagogy in which the teacher transmits knowledge to the student, it has a place in the classroom as long as that's not the only type of teaching and learning that's happening, right? Then all of us, I think we've been trained in the social constructivist view, the teacher, the student center pedagogy, right? And then he, uh, in this uh, outer circle um, in blue, he talks about a transformative aspect. So that means uh, allowing learners to examine power relations and all of the uh, situations that affect not only their learning processes, but also their lives, because they are human beings, just like we are, right? So in other words, if we look at it from Freire's uh, perspective, um, that, that is uh, teaching our students to read the word and the world. So in that sense, I will revisit this idea. Why focus on identity? And this is a great idea that I just got permission to use from a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Le Chen. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. And uh, I guess you might have heard about the ugly duckling story, right? So the ugly duckling was a, a, a duckling that uh, was teased because uh, he didn't act much like a duckling. He didn't look much like a duckling. But then in the end, he was never a duck. He was a swan. And then he grew up to become this beautiful swan. And everybody was like, oh my God, look at that beautiful swan, right? So that's the story. And she made this, uh, she used it as a metaphor. So if we think about uh, our students as ducks, that go to an um, animal school to become swans because the swan is the ideal model. Well, guess what? They will never be swans, right? So if we look at the swan as the uh, monolingual native speaker of English, then, and I say monolingual because that's the only kind of speaker that has no um, cross-linguistic influence from any other language, uh, then that's problematic, right? So those are uh, identity questions that we should raise in the classroom. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how we did this uh, in my class. So you see, the teacher is frustrated, the uh, student is frustrated too, because ducks can never be swans. And this is based on Vivian Cook's uh, idea of the multi-competent multi speaker. So here we go with the show and share. So the first uh, activity that I wanna share is this one uh, that is called an identity portrait. Uh, so this is based on the work of a good friend of mine, Dr. Srimali Hirath, and the work that, I've, that we've done with Antoinette Gagné, who's also here, hi Antoinette. <laughs> and, uh, what we are acknowledging is that um, images can be very powerful uh, to help us um, also unpack our own identities. And sometimes they could be more powerful than words. So this is what uh, I did in my classes. I gave my students a blank silhouette. I gave them crayons uh, and markers. And I said, show me who you are. Show me what you like, uh, your interests, what's important for you. If languages are important for you, then show me that. If religion is part of who you are, then put it there. And uh, then this is what my students created. Oh, that's a, a picture of them creating their identity portraits. And uh, the first thing that I see here is that they're too close to each other for COVID social distancing. But that was life before COVID, right? So look at that. Some of them completely rejected the pattern and then they said, I'm going to do my own thing. Very talented. I cannot do that. So uh, don't get scared or discouraged. 
And then we did something very interesting. We did gallery walks. So we put these around the classroom and then uh, we would take turns. Uh, one group would stay by their creation. The others would walk around. And uh, then every one of them had to explain their creation and what each thing meant. And the other students could ask questions. It works wonderfully on Zoom too. I've done it. So it's perfectly possible. And look at that, that's Elise uh, explaining her uh, beautiful creation. Uh, it was quite fun and it was a good learning experience. And I'm gonna let Elise uh, tell us about her creation. Thank you, Maron. Um, thank you everyone. I'm super, super happy to be here and honored to be here uh, as well. Um, first of all, like I love this activity and I'm going to explain why. Um, I believe that learning languages, it's more about how to deal with our feelings and emotion and discovering ourselves more than just learning technical skills or how to apply grammatical rules or things like that. And what I appreciate is that this activity was actually one of the first activity we've done on class. So in class, um, at the very beginning, you don't know anyone. You don't know, uh, um, you, you didn't have the time yet to build a relationship with the people. And one of the thing as a, as a learner that I experienced to be an obstacle in your in the progress of, um, of the language is um, fears or, or to be shy or to be just scared to expose yourself. So you need to have this safe environment to build um, a friendly atmosphere where you can actually expose yourself and be vulnerable. And this uh, activity was very easy at the, at, the, at the beginning because we don't need to use words uh, as the first steps. We just need to draw and express ourselves, and, and just to be and kind of connect with this common language that we can have also without using words because communication is way more than just using words it can be just even your body language or, or, or a draw or anything creative. So it helps us to connect with each other without having to face the obstacle of the language, especially that we are all in the classroom from different culture, different background, different languages. So it can be also a little bit impressive at the very beginning. And what I appreciate as well is because it's, it's it was working like a gallery. So as Marlon said, like everyone was standing in front of their drawing. And so um, the other half of the class will come and ask question about or, or um, draw. And that will just start genuine, uh, authentic, simple, natural conversation. And so because it's so natural and also it's just like one of your peers or two people maximum who are going to interact with you. So it's not like I have to expose myself in front of the whole class and try to do, try to, um, to start a public speaking, you know, um, that can be very scary for many, many students. Um, so because it was just little interaction with few peers, we actually start to know each other better. And without noticing, we were building those relationships to feel comfortable enough exposing ourselves. And I guess, and I feel that this way of introducing English um, was breaking down the obstacle that we may have to actually progress through relationship and through creativity. So that was a, that's a wonderful experience. I muted myself. Okay, here we go. So another activity that I want to share with you is a photo essay. So this was a way of merging those digital and traditional literacies. So uh, I had many students that were into photography. Uh, they were very talented uh, graphic artists, had their fancy cameras, all that. So I said, okay, how about if we do this? You say the essay is boring. Well, bring your cameras, bring your cell phones, whatever you use to take pictures. And I'll teach a class on photography. I don't have a PhD in photography. So feel free to jump in, contradict me, uh, question me. Um, and that sets uh, uh, more equitable power relations. Uh, and that was a, a good started uh, a starter for a conversation. So this is these are some of the slides that I use for that class. So if you look at this, um, 
We talked about what makes a great photo. So from Bach, uh, we get that a great photo uh, not only shows what's in the picture, but also evokes curiosity. So many students, like, uh, for example, many people don't notice that there's a, a third child here in this uh, famous picture, my grandmother. And that uh, what we see is what the photographer wants us to see. Like, we see the expressions, we see she's tired, she's thinking, she looks concerned. We don't know if there's a father for those children as well. There might be a father outside of the frame, but we don't know, right? So curiosity and emotion. So we talked about that. That's a picture of mine, that's my daughter. So what makes an image viral? positive emotional balance. I can post the most artistic picture on Instagram and it might get two likes, but I post a picture of my children and then I get like a hundred likes, right? So we talked about uh, how, what we focus on that we see, tend, we tend to look at the middle. Uh, we look at brightest uh, shiny things in the pictures. We prefer warm colors uh, to uh, cool colors. We look at human faces because uh, our evolution is based on that, right? The rule of thirds, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it, it means that uh, if you always put the, uh, the object in, right in the middle, it's kind of boring. Uh, these intersections here are more interesting. So here's one example. You see uh, where the eye is located uh, at precisely at that intersection. And then if we talk, this was a good to talk about the structure of pictures and how we use them to tell stories, just like we can use uh, a narrative essay to tell a story. So we see the girl on this side, uh, rule of thirds again, and we like the picture, but if we put her on the other side, we might feel that there's something wrong with the picture because we feel that she will soon be out of frame. So you see how pictures also follow structures. And that was important uh, for students to think about uh, why we need to follow those very rigid structures of academic English. Uh, looking at patterns, uh, we like patterns and sequence. So lots of rules about composition. And then last but not least, um, in their uh, best-selling uh, textbook, uh, Kress and uh, Lewin talk about a grammar of visual design. And so they say that composition is important because you have the different aspects of the picture, the subjects in the picture, and then how they relate to one another and how they're framed. And they also, uh, it's also important to consider what is salient, what is blurred in the background, right? So that is the grammar, that is the structure of, uh, of the essay, but in a picture, right? It's a, it's a good analogy. So we did photo walks and this is based on uh, the work of a uh, French educator and uh, pardon my French here, uh, Célestin Freinet. So uh, les promenades scolaires, learning walks. Uh, um, he talked about how students need to go out, leave the classroom, so they make contact with the real world, and then they learn about, or they relate what they see in the world to what they learned in the classroom, in the textbooks. And that was important for me. So I said, okay, bring your cameras, we'll go out, we'll go to the uh, forest around uh, our campus, and you will take pictures uh, of things or people, and by people, I mean someone in class, don't take pictures of a stranger at the bus stop. They might not like that. Uh, and then we're gonna take those pictures to the computer lab, and you're gonna write an essay uh, using those pictures. And uh, it was quite successful. These are my own photos that I took of my students. We would wait for a nice fall or spring day uh, that was super um, enjoyable to walk around. They were highly engaged, lots of smiles, playing with the leaves, lots of very powerful stories. 
look at this one. I'm going to read this part. This is from uh, one of the students that I had. Um, this was a love story between a can of Coke and a Tim Hortons coffee cup. It was a warm afternoon when Mr. Coke met a lady he had fallen in love with at first sight. He plucked up the courage to ask her for the telephone number. After that, he was haunted and all he could think about was her figure. At that moment, he dialed her number with shivering. May I invite you to my birthday party? She said, yes. He was too delighted to sleep all night to think only of how to make her happy. Nobody complained about having a uh, writer's block. Everybody wrote uh, beautifully. Sometimes uh, the essay structure was left a little aside, but that was okay. They were writing. That was, uh, was what was important for me. And this is Elise, and Elise can tell us about her beautiful essay. <laughs> Thank you, Marlon. Yes, I, re I remember when uh, we went outside and uh, again, um, it's all about relationship and uh, the way that through my relationship with uh, those women that we see in the picture helped me a lot to progress in my in my English, actually. What I appreciate with that kind of activity is that we tend to um, recenter the focus on the activity itself and not just the performance or the structure that can be um, not easy to understand for everyone. Um, also, I like to approach languages as like a kid. Like if you think about it, a, a kid, the way that they learn languages, they don't have a first language reference to learn their language. Uh, they just look around, they, they observe, they hear, they repeat. Um, and, and that's the way that they learn step by step. And so when we start focusing on the activity, for example, taking pictures, talking with people, say, oh, can you just uh, move a little bit for taking a picture? Like naturally we start applying all those skills that we have learned in the classroom in this context because it's so practical and we have an end goal we are observing around where we we have an idea in mind of which kind of picture we're going to take because we want it to be original we know we're going to write a story about it so we try to be creative and thinking more about what's going to be my story rather than just how am i going to tell my story um and that helps to just naturally have this uh, those words coming and um, I think that also with in, in my in my um, in this uh, photo shoot, uh, my story was around the process of, of building relationship and to talk about how um, in those three months of um, EAP ESL class uh, process, uh, the first month we just didn't know really each other with my with the, these ladies who are my friends now, and uh, at the very beginning we were just trying to be nice with everyone, but then second part you you kind of choose to be friend with those people, and then the third part is more like now we're comfortable and that was a good um, analogy of my process with the language as well because at the very beginning I was um, I, I was afraid to speak because of my accent I was not feeling legitimate to to share because of that and uh, the fear of being different but then you kind of choose to embrace this new ident identity you have to uh, kind of go through the process of discovering who you are in this language. You need to um, connect with this language to have different expression that you cannot use in your native language. Now you have to apply in, in this second language. So, and then the third uh, part of the process was to actually give yourself permission of doing mistakes and just kind of being this new, uh, this new self. Because I was trying to be my French version of myself in English, but it was not working. Um, and that's why, again, I will say it again, um, I, I believe that learning languages is all about self-discovery and, um, and dealing with our, ourself first. So this activity definitely helped me with that too. And just uh, to give you a, a little bit of, a, uh, of an idea of the diversity in that picture. So there's a, a Brazilian woman, a Syrian woman, uh, a Uyghur um, woman uh, who lived in Germany and then uh, Elise uh, from France. And they were all very good friends even though they had such diverse backgrounds. Thanks Elise. And uh, that also led us to, uh, we recently uh, wrote a book chapter for a volume on um, 
on uh, multi-ethnography, which is a reflective practice in which we go back and look at uh, learning and teaching processes and um, our own experiences. And we had this critical conversation. So it is titled, Helping English Language Learners Negotiate Their Legitimate Academic English User Identities, A Critical Conversation Between a Language Learner and Her Teacher. So uh, it's coming soon. I'll share it with you <laughs> when it's available. Uh, so um, this and this uh, beautiful graph, it's something that uh, Elise created. So we put our uh, intersecting identities there. Uh, it's funny, we have the same three languages in common, but um, my French is a functional French, uh, where in my Spanish is, uh, well, it's my first language, but and then Elise is learning Spanish. Uh, so Elise, can you tell us a little bit about this experience of uh, like when this crazy professor told you, let's write a book chapter together? <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was really, for me, it was uh, an honor to see like, oh, don't you think that I need to have a better level or <laughs> to share my work or to share with you? And that's the point, I guess, and I'm so happy to share that with the, uh, English teacher uh, is the first person with who you will feel comfortable to expose yourself as a student will be your professor. It won't be the people in the classroom because you know that because he's your professor, he's not going to mock at you. He's not going to judge you. He's here to help and he's here to help you to progress um, and make you feel comfortable. So once you build this relationship with your teacher, um, it's easier than to expose yourself and practice the language with the class, right? So I was really happy um, in this um, just adventure of uh, writing this chapter in this book with my professor to see that we kept this strong relationship where also um, I can apply everything that I've been learning to be useful for other people because it's all about then sharing everything that you learn and then you share. And, and all of also the great tips that uh, that Marlon gave to me just uh, I always say like thank you so much because you did not just um, help me to learn English but actually to feel comfortable with the language and um, uh, yeah for me it's a, it's a very great opportunity to have done that with you Marlon just take advantage to honor you at the same time oh well, thank you Elise um, okay so uh, now you may be thinking this looks all great, but we cannot go outside and walk with our students anymore. Well, guess what? Last year, I was really disappointed that COVID happened before we had our um, photo walk. So I said, and those were the times in which everything was so uncertain. So I told my students, okay, now, um, how about if you use your cameras? I taught the class. Uh, on Zoom and on photography. And I told them, use the camera to tell me how you feel, how life is uh, during lockdown. And it was such a powerful experience. That's why I have this citation here about um, uh, a research uh, methodology that is known as photo voice that is a, a participatory um, research um, approach. And uh, because I learned so much about uh, my students' uh, struggles, fears, like I, I got an insight that was, uh, like I felt very privileged. And, and I, I was able to reach out to some of them that I felt that uh, needed some help. Uh, so again, it's something that, can be easily adapted to remote uh, teaching and learning. Now, before I share some um, examples of, uh, of a couple of activities uh, from my current students, I want to share some um, advice on things that I've learned this year. And I think that uh, you've learned a lot too, and uh, I would be uh, looking forward to hearing from you. But the first thing that I would say is important was that we should be willing to, like it, when it comes to technology, to stretch and learn new technologies. Learning is good, even though it might be challenging. 
but you always have to be to remember to be kind to yourself don't take on challenges that are too much for what you can do at the moment so um set realistic goals what i do is i set short-term goals so my short-term goal for this year was like doing good youtube style mini lessons using iMovie mastering iMovie do i master uh iMovie now no but i got a lot better like i can produce a mini lesson in about 30 minutes long-term goal now i want to do to use more sophisticated software like final cut um also embracing perfection if you want that three minute video to be perfect you will probably be recording it like a thousand times i just learned to put the camera on if i go like blah, 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 it doesn't matter i just continue right it is what it is uh and students don't mind uh also uh combining uh synchronous and asynchronous uh, activities was key for me because i didn't want to uh, have my students sit uh to get a three-hour lecture from me every class um then uh, when creating multimodal content have a script uh, jot down some notes, uh, have a structure, an outline. You can stick this underneath your camera and then you just follow it, knowing that it will not be perfect and that's okay. We have to learn to live with that. Uh, be creative uh, when uh, not only when producing your content, but also when, uh, when it comes to using what you have. We have cell phones, right? You can use this uh to record your mini lessons and post them on youtube uh if you don't have a tripod well we have books right you can put the you can prompt the uh cell phone with books that's all okay and if you want your students to engage in this uh creation of multimodal content modeling goes a long way so when i ask my students to create assignments that were multimodal i saw them using similar cues to what I used when I created uh, my online content. So that's important. Last but not least, I wanna show you just two things uh, fairly fast. Um, I created this multimodal assignment for a second year undergraduate class. And it was a self-reflection on uh, my students' experience in the course and uh, how their learning journeys had happened. The first example from uh, uh, Theo uh, was in a podcast style um, assignment, uh, a format. Uh, so Theo, uh, he actually built on, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, fireside um, chats or conversations. So President uh, Roosevelt, uh, when uh, radio was something new, or relatively new, he used to have these uh, conversations in which he talked to American citizens as if he were one of their friends and they were just sitting by the fireplace having a conversation. So that's what Theo used. And then Constance, uh, she created a trivia game that is super interesting. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides and I will take you to my, um, to my space to show you that. Uh, okay, Let's see, share sound, good, this one, yes. Okay, so this is Tails. The English class. Okay, so this wait. Good morning, everybody, and welcome on Tales Podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful Monday. Today, it's a beautiful day, actually. It's pretty sunny. It's 20 degrees outside, so I hope you guys are having a wonderful day going outside because this is actually pretty rare. So I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. So what are we going to talk about today? So today, I'm going to be talking about my semester. 
my semester at York University at Glendon College, uh, I took a English class. So this English class um, actually taught me a lot about and made me improve my English. So we are going to talk about that today. So I have a few questions that I uh, that I sent to you guys by Instagram, and we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try and answer them. All right. So first question is. What did you learn uh, during this this English class? So, what did I learn? Good question. So, basically, um, during this English class, we had like we had a book. It was a, a TED Talk book. So, I don't know if you know this uh, this uh, this show. If we can call it a show, really. Eh? But uh, I don't know if you know about this show. So you get a sense of what uh, the podcast uh, format uh, sounds like, and and how he uh, delivered this assignment in a, in a creative and different way. And one thing that you can do to combine this with the traditional uh, like writing that you're supposed to do in one of these classes is that you can have students create a script. And then you can actually, actually check the script before they do the recording. Or you can have them submit uh, behind the scenes uh, text that goes with the creation. And that is quite effective. Now, let me show you another one. Um, and this is Constance's uh, assignment. Uh, okay, where is my... Okay, so that's this one. Um, do you see the cell phone? Great. Oh, I think I'm not sure if I clicked on the share sound. Yes, there. Okay, so she created this trivia game. It was This is super interesting. Like I'm still finding um, new things in this. So if I click here, there's an incoming call. Hi, Mr. Valencia, it's Constance. How are you? Um, I'm just calling you because I would like to know if you could help us to get out of the Glendon campus. We just need you to solve uh, one enigma and then we will be able to end this uh, winter semester. Let us know if you can help us. That would be great. So just click on the pink arrow just under your phone. Let's go. So if I click here, then... Okay, <laughs> that was the other thing going on. So um, one of the things that I always felt sad about was that my students had signed up for study abroad programs and they could never go abroad, right? So she put herself, she photoshopped herself. This is a picture of Glendon. So that was really cool. Uh, and so this game has clues all over. And then I have to find letters. And then the letters all together say thank you. Uh, let me just show you a couple more things from this one. This year, I've decided I will be able to read any kind of English text. So, first, school text is. That's okay. I mean, I have the correction at the end. It's only grammar stuff. It's okay. It makes sense. Then I've decided to read novels. My mom and I got the old Hunger Games collection. So that's quite hard. But I mean, I've seen the movies in French, in English, but I've also read the book previously in French. So that was not that hard, but maybe harder for my mom. Um, and then maybe the easiest one, magazines. Okay, that might be easy because there is thousands of pictures in it and that's subject I like, uh, such as fashion, food or fitness. But this year I've discovered something new. Scholars essay and scholars article. I mean, in France, 
we only use French textures. Like, no one wants to talk in English. No one wants to worry about finding a text not in French. But I've decided that could be really useful for me. I mean, I can get better grade if I'm using something that no one else was used. But also for my knowledge, of course, it's not about only getting good grades, right? So yeah, at the end, I will be able to understand how an article is built, like to find the hypothesis, find the argument that in my article was quite small and that was quite strange. I was waiting for a way bigger paragraph, but I find it at the end. And I'm also able to understand where is the conclusion, where is the opening, because sometimes there is a question at the end. So yeah, I mean, now I'm able to understand English essays and article, academic article, and I will be able to use them in the future just to get not only better grades again, but to be able to open my point of view and to add some info I wouldn't find in French, because sometimes English has more ID, English is better, definitely. So see you on the next page. So let me just show you the last part. Um... Where is the land there? Uh, and uh, she photoshopped herself here as a cheerleader. <laughs> uh, so uh, the last part is very interesting because she talks about this uh, partnership that we created. So we, we were trying to bring this experiential education. Like, how do you do this if they cannot be uh, on campus, right? So uh, with uh, my, um, my uh, colleague, uh, Ian Martin, we created these partnerships. Uh, we paired like students that were learning French as a second language with our ESL students who were learning English as a second language. And this was quite successful. And um, you can see um, how excited uh, Constance is about this partnership. Hi Elise, how are you? Oh, I'm so happy to have you on FaceTime today. But I think I have to hang up because my teachers need me. Do you mind calling me in a few minutes? Great, see you. Sorry, Elise just called me. Yeah, you know Elise, my new friend. Oh, yeah, at first I wanted to talk about uh, all the benefits I got. Like I'm able to paraphrase text, I'm able to synthesize an ID, I'm able to understand a graphic. That's an exclusive you will have to find. And I'm also able to talk with other people freely. And that's, I think, the most important thing. Like, I've met a new friend. I'm so happy we had this partnership with another class. I've been able to meet a nice girl, Elise. I'm so happy I've met her. I've not even been able to come to Toronto this year. So that's super great. I've been making friends online. Elise is just so nice. She takes her time if she has to help me to correct something like a sentence or if I have a pronunciation problem, she helped me to improve it. And I know she's following some French classes, so I'm helping her too. We've been sending each other packages with Canadian and French stuff in it. We are talking over Snapchat every day. I mean, it's not only the one hour we have to spend every week to talk together, that's enough. We need to be friends and I'm so happy. I'm so glad I've met her. And I wanted to thank you again for letting this partnership be able to make, like to happen. I'm so, so happy I've met her. I'm so happy I've met other classmates, even if that's only online stuff. I'm so proud I've met them and I'm really happy because they are so nice. I mean, Canadian people, come on, you're way better than a French one. I definitely need to come. <laughs> come on, let me go, let me go. So yeah, so amazing. Like I'm so proud of being able to talk with other people freely like I'm doing to my phone right now. I'm not scared anymore to talk with anyone. I would be a bit like frustrated if I couldn't speak to anyone from Canada. But at least the Zoom and this FaceTime call with Elise was just perfect to me to improve my English and to get friends all over the world. I mean, I'm so grateful and thankful. So thank you again. Mm. Don't forget to find the next clue. As I told you, it's about graphic. So pick your book. All right. And by the way, that's a different Elise, right? It's just a very popular, super cool name, right? Uh, all right. So that's uh, all I had to share uh, for the time being. Um, I, I want to let Elise uh, 
share a little bit more if she wants, uh, and I want you to share too. Thank you. Actually, I don't know a lot of it is that that I thought she was talking about me at the beginning. I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, yes, uh, definitely. I think that that's nice to kind of find a, a good balance between connecting the student uh, through creativity, to connect with the language, to build relationship, and having uh, as well this structure that we need, of course, because when I arrived in the country, for example, I didn't know anything about the APA style, for example. I didn't even know it was a thing. <laughs> I thought that everywhere in the world we were using the same techniques to write essays, for example. So, of course, I needed to learn um, a structure because then for the, for the next step of uh, my study and my journey, I needed to have those skills. So that definitely helped me to understand the academic system in Canada and uh, helped me to build more confidence because after the EAP, for example, the next step will be higher education uh, where most of the class are actually native speaker. So you want to, you want to feel kind of um, the same level if that's possible, not in the language because obviously they are native speaker, but at least to not just arrive in the class and be completely lost. Um, most of them, because they grew up in Canada, they grew up with already this structure already built. So we need to feel this confidence that I know enough to follow up and not be too behind, but at the same time to just uh, be um, patient with ourselves, like having um, to forgive ourselves, to um, have mercy with ourselves as well, like all this journey uh, in not being at the, at, the, at the top that we wished um, as we are in our native language. So um, having this balance is definitely super important. I think that in essays, for example, writing essays, um, it's important to connect the student with something he can relate on, that's something that speaks to him as well, um, because nobody gets creativity on something that's that is boring for them or something that is too structured. Also, I think the challenge is um, all those students have different background, different culture, different way of learning and that you teachers have a, a real challenge to kind of adapt with all those diversity in this um, different profile. But I think that if we just take the time to understand what is the purpose of each student personally. Um, what is the end goal? The end goal is not to become just fluent in the language because a language we're still learning. I mean, I, I still learn French, for example. Um, so we're always we're always in this process of learning. But the end goal um, is why am I going to um, in what am I going to apply English? Um, what is um, this tool of communication will be useful for me in what area? And then focus maybe on those areas. And that's why creativity helps you to recognize um, the language with the purpose of the language and maybe focus in uh, a slang or, or a vocabulary that we actually are going to need for the next step of our journey. Um, I hope that this gives some insight um <laughs> but if you want to share and ask question i'll be happy to share also my um, my view on it thanks elise uh, so i see there's a question from uh, from daniel 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 would you like to open up your mic or is it okay sure, yeah sure go ahead so um this is so amazing seeing everything that you've done incorporating the technology and really having students have ownership of their learning and expressing it in a way that um, that works for them. I think particularly considering the pandemic. So I was wondering, was this something that you already had in place at the beginning of the semester? Or was this something where you kind of like pivoted or made a change after the semester had started? That's a very good question. So uh, I've done like uh, one of my main uh, research interests is identity. So I, I did have that background, but then I was hired at this uh, institution that has a, a renowned uh, like uh, graphic um, arts uh, program uh, or programs. And then I, I was going there um, in the summer and I saw the students, like the photography students walking around with their DSLRs. And then at that point, and this is something I, I like to share, 
I was a closeted photographer. So that pushed me to uh, embrace that identity and say like, I am a photographer. And that's something that I want to leave you all with that it's okay to be a beginner at whatever it is that you want to explore because that's how we learn and we grow. So I said, let's explore this. I see that they're very artistic. The identity portraits give me a good hint. Like I thought like, oh, wow, these people are so good. They're scary. So <laughs> uh, I said, let's try and, and, and use an arts-based uh, pedagogy. And it was, uh, I got positive feedback. So I went on exploring. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. So feel free, please, to maybe we have like a few minutes in case you have any questions, you might uh, post it on Facebook or in the chat here. Or if you want, just feel free to open up your mic and uh, yeah, speak up if you want. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm very, very impressed by your work, Marlon. It was definitely inspirational for me. Uh, I've been reading tons about multimodality and multiliteracy lately. So uh, I, I can tell that what you have done is basically what education has craved for decades. Uh, at least three decades, we have been discussing about multiliteracies and how to understand multimodality as the means of communication that we have, because all communication is a multimodal and everything all meaning is multimodal basically but i think you you took a step further uh, with the creativity and with acknowledging the importance of identity uh, in the teaching of an additional language uh, and what you said at the beginning i think is key that we need to uh, start understanding that when we learn an additional language uh, is not like antagonizing monolinguals. <laughs> With us, please understand that I, that is not what I want to do. But nobody's monolingual anymore. Uh, we need to understand that translanguaging now is is a language that we all share, and nobody is fully monolingual anymore. So we cannot adhere to standards that are pushed onto us by people that just believe they can speak one language only uh, and, and it's quite silly so i think by um aligning the idea of uh, multiliteracy multimodality with identity it uh, created a, a, a beautiful cause so i just wanted to congratulate you and congratulate elise uh, for everything she did and also uh, say that is not something that you see every day that a professor at the university is able to share the spotlight with students. And, and I wanna applaud you for that because I think it's very necessary uh, that we teachers and then when we become professors acknowledge uh, that we will be nothing without our students. Uh, and that is something that we need to reflect upon. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. That's a very kind of you. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that one of the things that I always uh, tell or share with my students is that I am uh, like English is also an additional language for me. And I was also like them, a highly motivated uh, English language learner. And I think that goes a long way. And if you allow me uh, at least to just bring back this um, can you just share a little bit of what you told me uh, after the first class about your French accent? Okay, Marlon, remind my exact words. Okay. <laughs> so you came to me and you told me like, what can I do to sound more like you? Because I have this really uh, heavy French accent. Mm -hmm. I was feeling very uncomfortable because of, of my accent. Um, and I felt that I could not bring really legitimacy, that people will not really um, see me as credible as I am in French. Also because in French, communication is my strength, really. And um, I knew how to be fast to respond, I mean, to be quick to respond. And, and suddenly it's like who I am or what I thought defined who I was, let's say, 
um, disappeared. And I kind of get through an identity crisis in that moment, just to have to speak English all the time. Um, and so that's that's how Marlon helps me to reconnect and say, no, like um, your value or who you are is not defined by the way you speak or you communicate. And that's something that we need to learn and understand as a person. Um, that's okay that I struggle to sometimes express myself, but there, I think there is a lie um, that most of people learn the second language um, struggle with is to think that, oh, people won't be able to really see who I am if they cannot understand my language, if I cannot express myself in my language. Because in your language, you have your own slang, you have your own way of speaking, you know, expressions and things like that. And you feel I'm not able to use this uh, method of expressing really who, who I am. So how am I going to make true friends? How those people can be there for me? How can I really be there for those people if I'm not able to communicate properly? But I have experienced myself how to have deep connection with people uh, with few capacity of communicating uh, with words of, for example, I had a mission trip in um, Morocco and there um, the person was speaking Arabic and I was speaking French and there were no other language option for us to communicate. So no way for us to communicate. But with this person, I experienced a, a real connection with empathy with, I, I can't explain, but it was another way of communicating what, where we were able to see that we saw ourselves. And I, I believe that communication, it's more than just um, being able to, to speak, but it is to understand the intention of people or what are you really trying to say more than just the way you say things. The rest is practice. It can be shaped and all of that. But something that is also important for students to understand is that your accent is also telling your story. So when you reject your accent, you're at the same time unconsciously rejecting yourself and your story. And there you cannot grow up healthy inside of yourself and embrace this new, this new self if you are trying to reject at the same time where you come from. You know what I mean? So there is this deep, deep process actually to go through um, and understand that the second language is not, um, I don't need to become somebody else. I just need to discover who I am in a new communication format, let's say. So Marlon helped me to understand that through creativity and through all those activities. And I kind of had this um, breaking, uh, I don't have the words, how can I say that? But <laughs> I think you understand me, you understand my intention. Um, having this moment where I, I could be myself and stop focusing on wasting time becoming somebody else, but just enjoying and embracing my new identity in the second language. So now you see who should be the professor here, right? Chapeau, chapeau, Elise. Thank you. Any other comments, suggestions, complaints, anything? Just throw it at us. <laughs> Michelle, uh, I'm just seeing uh, old friends uh, from Chile. Uh, I did uh, part of my doctoral dissertation research. Uh, so I have a big, strong connection with Chile. I spent some time in Valpo and Santiago and and even um, I stayed in um, in Barbara's house, uh, so we're very good friends with uh, Robert. I'm and, sure you uh, had a everyone. fantastic time then. Yeah, you stayed at Barbara's house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think. Uh, well, first of all, Marlon, I was not the beginning. I'm sorry. Uh, we have three members of the Tisel Tile group here. And we want to thank you. You have the hearts over there, uh, Carla, Barbara, and well, Tiso Chile. Uh, we thank you very much for sharing this with us. I think that um, 
especially we here in Chile, I don't know that at times we feel that accent is an issue and we teachers are afraid of speaking in public or of speaking in this kind of events uh, just because uh, this accent that we can have. Um, I think this is very important. Uh, this idea, what Elise was saying, to create a new identity, to know that it is okay, it is acceptable, and to also think about it when we are teaching, right? When we are allowing the opportunity or when we correct our students or give feedback on uh, pronunciation and things like that. I think that we finished this with the many, many ideas, uh, new ideas, and a lot of things to reflect on and how are we allowing our students to be their own self uh, when using this language. There is another way of communication and again that we don't need to have a perfect pronunciation because I think there is no perfect pronunciation for it or um, any style or way of using this amazing communication way. Um, so I would like to say thank you again for this amazing opportunity. Uh, Marlon, you were sharing something? Yes, Maybe. no, I, before I forget, I just put there a link. Uh, you can see some of my uh, students um, uh, photo essays and other creations in that link. Um, and some of the background of the photo walks. Uh, and uh, of course, I'll type my email here so that you have it. Yes, we, we have people also on Facebook or and this is going to be recorded. So if you want to spread the word and tell your colleagues to go ahead and look for it, look for uh, the, the information that Marlon is providing us. And we're going to have these on our social media for you to see it and to keep spreading the word we're like <laughs> religious almost on this new identity and this new way of teaching and seeing English as a communicative way uh, without these constraints that sometimes we had in the past. Uh, so again, thank you very much everyone for participating. Don't forget to follow us in uh, our different social media, Instagram and Facebook. We are also posting this on YouTube. We're all of like, we're very Instagrammers, things that we feel like <laughs> with this new technology. Um, thank you, Camilo, for your comment. Yes, and your stories. And I, we hope to see you again. Actually, I, I think we're going to do a poll uh, on which day and time is best for you. So that is something that we should uh, get information from because we know that because of the craziness of this year again we're having some yeah. issues with attending so mm -hmm. I think we're going to make a, a, some a poll or something for you to tell us when and at what time will be best to do this kind yes. of uh, experiences. But we will do but more I, that's the interesting thing that we that, that's the that's the important thing that I want to repeat from what, what our director Carla Bustos just said we will have more of these webinars because we really believe in sharing the knowledge and building community. So we're all about it. <laughs> That's why, uh, and, and I'd like to thank, of course, Marlon again, and to say uh, hello to everybody here again. Thank you for coming. I see former teachers, professors, colleagues, students around there and friends. So yes, thank you everybody for coming here. Muchas gracias, <laughs> <laughs> Muchas gracias por el privilegio de ser los primeros. Yes, uh, the first one. Thank you for opening our season. <laughs> Very much deserved. Yes. Very much deserved. And we also, of course, invite you to think of ideas that you want to, for us to discuss. Uh, if you have something that you want to share with everyone, of course, you can email us or you can contact us in our social media so we can arrange and give you the platform that you deserve to share these amazing ideas and for everyone to have more discussion and more ideas. Barbara just left the email that you can contact us or you can send us a Facebook message or an Instagram message and we'll be more than happy to have a meeting and to arrange something like this for you, okay? Thank you very much, guys. We love Thanks. you and we want to continue sharing okay. all those ideas. Lots of love to everyone. Stay safe and happy. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.